All right, and then the next ones are in the book. So put your phone down, pick up a book. Turn to song 351. Our God, He is alive. Oh, are you going to take this one? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. <laughs> There's a few extra over here. There is the only Azure Oh. Uh -huh. 
take this off. <laughs> because I'm a little bit of distance at a static group, but my voice is very, very well. But I just want to say good evening to everyone. Um, this is welcome to the Nittany Church. Um, and uh, my name is Lana. My husband Henry and I moved here five years ago to be near our family, Jameson and Lauren and their children. And uh, we feel very blessed uh, to be here and understand we just dinner afterward. And some Penn, all, well, Penn State won. Right? Wow. <laughs> <That's a big laughs> deal. Victory. Victory over Auburn and it was Georgia and Stanford and my, San Diego State. Um, that was, it, was, it was really fun to watch the enthusiasm. And so welcome. Um, I've chosen to share 1 Peter 1, 3 through 4. Um, just guide our thoughts and open open up this special time together. Um, and it's something that I've been thinking a lot about uh, over the last, I don't know, month maybe? Um, just hope. What does that really mean for me? And, um, for all of us. It says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. And what struck me about this was the living hope. Mm -hmm. And it's it reminded me of a couple of things. The one is, you know, when I became a, um, found God and when I found um, found Jesus in my late twenties, it was so obvious to me this living hope. <clears throat> I'd been fairly religious and stuff, but it was so obvious because it, it was a hope that is rooted in just joy and and um, being alive, fully alive, knowing that you're right with God and that God is pleased with you. Even, you know, you know in your humanity, you're, you know, very perfect. But, but that living hope, and it's not wishing. The Greek translation here is energizing, active, alive in the soul of the believer. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, this season we're in, this is last two years, year and a half, going into the next season, or of course, school year and the fall and, um, and going back two years, it's been a time where hope could not feel, we could not feel hopeful. Um, there were so many, obviously, so many things with um, illnesses abounding, communities and loved ones all around the world and, um, and you know, just political problems. And uh, I know for me, I've at times put too much hope in other people um, outcomes of certain, as I was young, you know, romance, but marriage, and you know, uh, just putting so much hope in people and success and grades and projects and you know, and, and I realized that really the hope is in Jesus. It's not in the thing. We God wants us to pray for things, and you know, He He really wants us to. He loves us. He wants us to come to Him. But our hope is in Him, and that's everlasting. It doesn't perish, spoil, or fade. So I'm going to say a prayer, and um, we'll start with the rest of the service. Amen. Father, thank you so much for letting me share this um, with my friends here, and I just pray that um, we feel your presence as we Amen. sing, and we pray, and we talk, and, and we gain hope in you, and we lift our eyes up to you. Amen. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thanks, Lana. So you're right seated for this one. We're gonna sing 380. What can wash away my sin? 380.
and uh, open your Bibles to Isaiah chapter 64. That'd be great. And um, I wanted to start off this time of our service, which is communion, where we reflect on the life, death, and burial of Jesus Christ, and most importantly, His resurrection, and what it means for our lives. And in life, whether it's literature, whether it's art, uh, whether it's cuisine, <laughs> you need contrast. Yeah. Things don't stand out unless there's contrast. Yep. And especially when you do something every week, as Jesus asked us to do, because it's a great idea. But anything you do every week can become routine and you lose contrast. It just kind of all blends in. And so I thought it would be helpful today is, you know, starting in the Old Testament, Testament, and then we'll transition to Romans 5, is really the contrast of what life, even for well-intending folk, is like outside of Jesus. Because <laughs> that's a rough contrast. And I think it's summed up really well if you're in Isaiah 64, and... We're in verses 5 and 6. And this is what is said. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continue to sin against them, you are angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. You can study out, uh, if you're in the Septuagint, of course it'd be Greek, but if you're studying out in the Hebrew, exactly what that is, I won't go into that right now, uh, but it's pretty graphic what a filthy rag is. You can picture your own mind uh, what that might be, but we all shrivel up like a leaf. And like the wind, our sins sweep us away. Wow. Now, you think about that. These are good intending people. These are people, you know, God's people who want to do good, but they're always up against it. You always ever had a situation, no matter what you did, you were up against it. Yeah. You just kept beating your head against the post. And you know what's so great about beating your head? against a post Stop it. is when you stop because <laughs> then you have contrast so for contrast <laughs> let's go to Romans 5 and we're going to pick it up in verse 6 we're going to be reading verses 6 through 8 Romans chapter 5 of course Paul writing to a group of believers and he says this you see at just the right time when we were still powerless Christ died for the ungodly very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person though for a good person someone might possibly dare to die but God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the passage goes on, and I'm not the preacher, and so I'm not going to deliver a sermon on this, because what comes next is a great, 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 great um, passage to study out um, theologically, just about how important Jesus is and why uh, we need his blood and so many uh, aspects. But it's more than that. It's more than just the redemption. It's more than the reconciliation. It's that we can actually have a really incredible life in Christ. Yeah. So different than you ever would imagine. Certainly different for me, very different than I imagined when I became a Christian at 27. And that was a few years ago. And I think about every day, I think about the contrast between yeah. Jesus and me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty big contrast 
Some would call it a, a, a chasm, a, maybe the Grand Canyon. <laughs> but you know, because of his love, because of what he did to make it an avenue to God for me, oh, whew, man. All right, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Now that I hopefully we've had a little contrast here that you've had a chance to process a bit, I, what I'd like to do is uh, go to our Father in prayer. And then we have generally uh, some grape juice and well, that'll be distributed. So that will be uh, handed little cups. So we'll have on the top a wafer that represents the body of Christ and then some grape juice that represents his blood. So we're going to go to our Father in prayer and then we'll take communion together. Heavenly Father, thank you that we don't have to compare ourselves to trees in the fall that are deciduous <laughs> with leaves dying and then blowing away and getting kept being blown away by powers that we are helpless and defenseless against, Father, no matter how great, how good, how righteous our intentions, we just fall short. But God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he did not fall short, that he was determined, that he stayed close to you, the source of his power, and that he willfully chose to die so that we could, have each of us, every woman in this room, every man, could have a relationship with you with confidence because of what he did, not what we do. Anyway, thank you for his example, his sacrifice. Thank you for the mystery and the power you exhibited in raising him from the dead and giving the victory over death that each of us needs. As we take the wafer, let us remember his body. As we drink the fruit of the vine, let us remember blood, which cleanses us at a tremendous cost. So Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay. After this time of reflecting on the contrast and the great privilege of being united with Christ, during this part of our service, we take up a contribution. We don't pass a plate. We, uh, we just have a plate in the back, and the funds uh, donated there for the work of the church, for the ongoing activities of the church. And a lot of us give online. That's well, we don't pass a tray in case you're wondering, but uh, we'd uh, you know, always appreciate uh, that people will uh, want to give out of their own volition. And if you go to Acts um, 20, verse 35, I'm going to read a passage that all of you know, but um, and probably you've wrestled with to really figure out if it's, you know, how it's true, not if it's true, but how it manifests as truth. And this is a scenario in Acts 20, is you have an older man, Paul, one of the most influential men uh, of his day, planting churches over the known world. Uh, he's headed back to Jerusalem. He knows what's going to happen. It's going to eventually lead to his death. And he is a man, even though he's older, he's, he's still in a hurry. And so he's on his way back to catch a boat, you know, and eventually go across the Mediterranean, and he's in Miletus, which is about 45 miles from this town called Ephesus, where there's probably a church that got to 40,000 people, if you can imagine that. Having been to Ephesus even today, even though it's been silted in, it's not a port town anymore, it's still really impressive. But he's in Miletus, and he's, he's in a hurry, because you know what, we gotta get the elders, we gotta get the old guys. We gotta get the old guys from Ephesus and they gotta come on over here. It's not like you just hop in your car and go. It was a several day journey. But he's going and he's saying all sorts of things because he also tells him he's not gonna see him again. And so, you know, 
They're working through a lot of stuff. But then in, this, in verse 35, he says something that uh, is really pretty impressive. And uh, now I almost always um, print out what I'm reading, but I couldn't get my home computer to work there. It came back again. This is why I, I don't use these. I, I like it. I can use an iPhone. It's just sometimes it goes away. But it came back to me. In verse 35, he says, In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now, I'm not going to belabor this, but there is something that came to me as I was studying this out this morning. Because receiving is pretty nice, right? <laughs> yeah. Let's face it. I mean, you know, there are many cultures that are set up on receiving. And people can get pretty used to it. And uh, you know what? I like to receive pretty much too. So what is it about giving that's better or more blessed? Because, you know, basically, it's something that is really good for the giver. Well, first of all, we all think about, well, first of all, you got to be in a position to give. You, you know, you got your life going on. You know, things are okay for you because you are actually got your mental and physical faculties, and you're actually in a position to give. And that's good, right? If you've never been knocked down by bad health or bad life experience, uh, you will. You will. And you'll know how much you'll appreciate getting back up again and being able to be a giver. But that's not even the best part. You know the best part, the difference between receiving and giving, I finally figured out? You think, wow, it took you that long to get it? Yeah, sometimes I'm a slow learner. Here's the point. Giving requires faith. Yeah. Because you're wondering, is there going to be enough time left for me if I'm always serving other people? People are a big hassle. <laughs> you know, if I spend it all on these people, I'm not even sure they're worth it. You know, I mean, some people, they're definitely worth it. Oh, yeah, they're fine folk. There's other people, I don't know. Come on. Mm -hmm. You've had these thoughts. Yeah. But money, will there be enough? Yeah. Yeah. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. The blessing of giving is it requires something you, you can't see, that, yeah. that God himself is going to take care of you. That it's all going to work out if you just follow his way. So anyway, as we give today, uh, it's some time before you leave. Think about that. I'm just going to say a prayer for the contribution. Then we're going to get on with the next part of the service. So I'll pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessing of being able to give. What it means with respect to our current status and condition. But also with respect to the opportunity to develop something that's more precious than gold that is our faith mm -hmm. and thank you for the, all the ways you've taken care of us as we have chosen to give and to give in a way that pleases you so Jesus we pray amen amen, amen. amen. thank you Henry for those thoughts uh, once again since I'm sitting at least six feet away I'm going to demask um, just so that you guys can hear me in a little less muffled uh, if you're joining us on Zoom, we're so glad you're here and uh, hope that you are able to participate. Uh, Brandon is running Zoom, so if you have anything to contribute uh, during our discussion portion, if you'd like to, you can just type it in the chat and Brandon will uh, read it out for you. Uh, so, we are going to have a bit of a discussion-based uh, sermon today. Uh, and if you would like to, you can turn your Bibles over to Acts chapter 2. And as you're turning over there, uh, we have a couple of special prayer requests that I just wanted to make everybody aware of. And the first one is, uh, so John Hamilton did have a successful knee replacement surgery, although uh, the recovery is long and very difficult, as some of you in the room actually know. Um, and so let's continue praying for John Hamilton as he's recovering from um, a, a pretty serious surgery. And also that Fran can um, really you know, have the energy to take care of, uh, of John. Um, but also on a, on a sadder note, the Hamiltons have some really good friends in New Jersey where they're from um, who have had a series of pretty tragic events happen, some losses in the family, a, a young father who's um, uh, just had twins, unfortunately passed away, and, um, and uh, there, there was another loss in the family as well. And so the, the Hamiltons, I think, are feeling uh, a lot of pressure uh, and, and a lot of um, just sadness. So let's make sure that we're uh, reaching out to the Hamiltons. 
Um, but also, um, you know, that we can pray for this family. The, um, it's a, a, like a French sounding name, so I may get this wrong, but Gilad, I think is how you say their family name, the Gilads. Um, and then finally, Alex, who was supposed to actually be up here right now preaching, uh, is pretty sick as well, and he's at home. And so let's, um, let's pray for, for those three folks, okay? Is there anybody else who has any, you know, specific prayer requests? All right, let's go to God in prayer, and then uh, we'll carry on. Father, uh, you know, as Lana mentioned in the, the welcome and the call to worship, uh, there are a lot of difficult things happening. And uh, we're grateful, God, that we can rejoice with you and uh, with one another, and, and also that we can mourn uh, with you and with others in our community here, God. Um, we want to lift up uh, the Galads, Gilads, um, and just pray that, uh, you know, in the, in the midst of some serious tragedy, Father, that uh, disciples around them can uh, care for them, uh, that they would feel and experience your love in ways that um, they never have before. And, uh, we also pray that you'd use the Hamiltons in their lives in a really special way. God, empower the Hamiltons with your spirit uh, to be able to care for them. And on that note, we pray for John and his recovery and uh, for Fran as uh, she's caretaker for him. And, uh, just pray that they can both have energy uh, and that John in particular can get healthy and get back up and moving around very quickly. And finally, we just want to lift up uh, Alex, our campus minister and great friend, and just pray that um, he can have a quick recovery from his illness and uh, all the other things that are going on in our lives, God, we also just lift them up to you. And we know that you know, um, even if, um, you know, each one of us doesn't know every specific thing that's going on in one another's lives. We know that you know and that you care and that you even know how many steps we've taken and the number of hairs on our head. And uh, We're grateful for that, Father. We're grateful for your love. And, uh, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, today, I want to talk about two words, or the discussion is going to be around two words in particular. And these are two words that are pretty important. As a matter of fact, these are two words that um, without them, we may feel utterly alone. We would have no one to pick us up if we fall. Or maybe without them, we would feel so selfish that we'd be obsessed with our own individual pursuits. Perhaps without these two words, we're left thinking that our needs are the most important in the world or that our problems are so unique that nobody else could ever understand. But with these two words, we can experience love. We can experience joy and share our joy together. We can share our grief together with these two words. We can share celebration and victory. With these two words, we can appreciate the joy of connection to one another and to God and the comfort that comes from deep relationships and the support of lifelong friendships. These are two important words. The first is a word that we never use. It's sort of an archaic word, neighborliness. It's archaic because it's a hard word to say, but go ahead, say it with me, neighborliness. neighborliness. Research shows that if you participate, you're more likely to remember. So let's say it one more time, neighborliness. neighborliness. That's right. The next word, is community. Let's say that one together. Community. community. That one's easier and one that we use more often, but we're going to define both just so we know exactly what it is we're talking about, okay? So neighborliness is defined as kindly concern, interest, support. Related words are brotherhood and community. Neighborliness implies community and is an aspect of healthy community. The academic definition for community, since I'm back in academia now, I'll have to sprinkle some of that stuff in, but not too much because I don't want to bore anybody. Uh, the academic definition for community is a group of people that interact and support each other and are bound by shared experiences or characteristics, a sense of belonging, and often by their physical, and I'm going to add this one, or spiritual, or emotional, or mental proximity to one another. Neighborliness is an aspect of community. Each one of us is designed by God to need community. With community, we can experience joy, not only our own, but everybody else's joy. 
And with community, we realize that actually our problems are not that unique. And, and the things that we're going through, other people in our community also can relate to. And there's so much strength in that. There's so much support in lifelong friendships within your community. Without neighborliness, it's pretty difficult to have community. Without support and concern for one another, it's very difficult to build a healthy community. As we've talked about in the last few weeks, some of the aspects of our faith community here are participation, transformation, and multiplication. You guys remember those words? Yeah. All right. They rhyme. So again, research shows, I'm making this part up, but it's, it's probably true. Research shows that if a word rhymes, you're more likely to remember it. I think that's true. It's my anecdotal research. How about that? Uh, in our faith community, there should be no spectators, but rather everybody contributes. That's participation. The goal of the church that I see in the New Testament is one where each disciple, no matter your background, no matter anything that's specific to you, uh, each disciple is able to live out their discipleship in a community that's supportive, but that they can also contribute to. Each disciple is vitally necessary. And that's what it's like here in this community. Each person really makes a difference. Yeah. And so in this faith community, we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to contribute. Also, transformation. This community is about transformed lives. And Henry alluded to it, and I'm sure if you want to know uh, the contrast between who he was at 27 and who he is now, I'm sure I'd be happy to tell you stories, because <laughs> I've heard them all, and maybe he would too. Uh, but, but that's the idea, is that the longer you are following Jesus, and the, the longer that you're in a supportive faith community, the more you're going to transform to be like Jesus. And as a matter of fact, you can put off the old self and put on the new self, created to be like God. That's a crazy phrase that Paul uses in Ephesians. We're created to be like God. And so often, I think probably too often, we as people, sometimes we as Christians, but I'll just keep it as we as people, kind of think that we're victims to our circumstances and to our situations and to our locales rather than living this crazy victorious life in which we're created to be like God. We're going to talk a lot more about who God says we are later on in the fall. But there's a difference between being a victor and a victim. And God has created us to be victors. Uh, and finally, the idea of multiplication. And we see this all over the New Testament. That once people experience transformation for themselves, once they participate in a supportive faith community, it's not even a command. It's just it, it, there's an outpouring from the Spirit, where people just say, hey, just come and see. Come and see Jesus. Come and see this transformation that I've been able to experience. It's not about me, not about how great I am, because that's definitely not the truth, but you just gotta come and see Jesus and this community that's built up yeah. around him. And so, part of the aspects that we're trying to focus on for this faith community, participation, transformation, and multiplication. You're gonna have an opportunity in just a minute to participate. This is not a lecture. This is a discussion. I'm just talking a little bit extra right now because I want to you know, frame the discussion. But think about the questions that we're going to ask. Think about the scripture, the scripture that we're about to read. And the more you contribute, the better this is going to go. So please feel free to, to add your thoughts. Let's go over to Acts chapter 2 right now. And we're going to talk about barriers and opportunities when we're building community. Barriers and opportunities in building community. Uh, I'm going to read Acts chapter 2, and then I'm going to stop talking as much and uh, give you guys an opportunity to share a little bit. Acts chapter 2, and I'm going to start reading here in verse 42. Now, some scriptures are meant to just sort of tell us what happened. Uh, they're historical. Some scriptures are inspirational. Some scriptures are meant to help us uh, to praise God or to understand more about God. Some scriptures are meant to be precedent setting. They're meant to set precedent so that we can go back and understand how it was done then and there so that we can implement it here and now. We're going to read a scripture that's meant to be precedent setting right now. This is describing the very first church. Jesus has died, risen from the dead, charged his disciples with going out and preaching the message of salvation and transformation and multiplication. And this is the opportunity where they do that for the very first time. 
3,000 people get baptized outside of the temple in Jerusalem because there were already baptistries, ritual baptistries out there. And so just thousands of people are a part of this new church. And here's what it looked like to be a part of that faith community then and there. Chapter 2, verse 42. They, all of those new Christians, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe. And many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now I'd like to ask... Just some uh, context questions here. Uh, having read this scripture, and, and probably this is not a new scripture to you, because we even read this scripture quite often, um, again, because it is meant to be precedent setting. Do you see elements of participation, transformation, and multiplication here in the first century church? And if so, what would those elements be of participation, transformation, and multiplication? What do you see? Yeah, everybody. So they were all, all together every day. And they were, yeah, they, they praised and worshiped and, and shared food together. I mean, that, that sounds like participation to me. That's everybody. That's not 20% of the group. That's everybody. Yeah. Yeah, what else? Yeah, they were active participants in their own faith. They were agents of their own faith. It wasn't just a one-way transfer of information or knowledge or anything else. This was active participation in the workings of the church, in scripture, in studying, and in interacting with Jesus' teachings. Yeah, that's a great, great point. What else stands out to you? Participation, multiplication, transformation. That's right, daily. And I love how you said it, and it's how the scripture says it too. They weren't necessarily, I mean, they weren't being shy. They were letting their light shine, but they were focused on their relationship with God and the community and building that community. And the other people were added to their number because God did it. So through their participation and as they were transforming, God was the one who was adding to their number. Now, for sure, they were out preaching and, you know, doing incredible things for sure. But it's... It's a result of their transformation and participation. The reason it ended up in scripture is because it's abnormal, right? People don't just sell property and give away all the proceeds. As a matter of fact, people try to do the opposite now and then. <laughs> try to accumulate as much as possible and hoard it for themselves. But in this instance, people were doing the opposite. They were selling and giving away as much as they could. That is total transformation of mindset around wealth, yeah, and property. Somebody from Zoom? Too often now, I think, um, we're separated from the people that we might be trying to give to. Um, we're separated by organizations or a website or, you know, um, many other things. Uh, but, but here you get the, the, the sense that they knew one another and they knew each other's needs so that they could meet those needs within their community. And by the way, part of the reason that the Lord added to their number daily was because they were having an impact outside of their immediate faith community. They were having an impact in the broader community of Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and eventually the ends of the earth. So, yeah, great point. Yeah, that's a good point. And, um, you know, over, over the years, we've been here part of this church now for eight years. Uh, over the years, as, as I've studied the Bible with other people, and uh, you know, as, as many of the students have, have studied the Bible with other people, we've talked about this passage in particular. You know, I, I always try to ask the question, well, where do you see this happening? And so often people will say, I see it in this church. And that's you all. I mean, you, you guys are doing this. And so this is not a, hey, you're not doing this at all, and you need to get your act together. Rather, this is like when Paul is talking to the churches, and he's like, hey, I know you're so loving, but you know what? Do so more and more. I know that we are doing our best to live this scripture out, and amen, and other people see it. But you know what? Let's do so more and more. If this is the precedent, if this is the goal, let's, let's get as close to this goal 
as, as we possibly can. Now, as um, you know, as we think about what it means to try and implement or uh, become more and more like this passage, I think it's important to identify barriers. If you want to reach a goal, you got to know where you're going, and you got to know what barriers are in the way. So for you all, and there's no right answer here, this is just more what you think and what you see and what you observe and your own opinions, but um, what do you see as barriers, whether hypothetical or actual, to building this faith community here, to be more like what we see in Acts chapter 2? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And the idea of hospitality is very closely related to the idea of neighborliness. Yeah. And neighborliness is not something that we only have to practice here, but in your neighborhoods. Whether your neighborhood is a dorm or it's a community that you're a part of, it's an actual neighborhood. You can think about that as your neighborhood and your opportunity to be neighborly. And some of you, many of you might be thinking, I don't own a home. And that's true. And you don't have to. Uh, you can be hospitable wherever you are. You can have people in your dorm room. You can, you can get a group of people together in the dining hall and make that something special uh, and make that an opportunity to practice community and neighborliness. And those of us who do have homes, uh, I think are very open to regularly opening our homes to all of you so that you can be a part of it and you can bring people there. In fact, Leslie did that just the other day um, uh, on Friday night, I think, right? And had many of you over to her home and I know the Crankles do that every other week and uh, so do we for family group and the Kramers are constantly having people over and so there's many opportunities um, to be a part of, uh, you know, practicing hospitality in that way. What are uh, some other barriers that you see in becoming more and more like what we see in this scripture? Yeah, I've talked to, so that's a great point. I've talked to a few different professors uh, so far this semester. Um, and, and one of the things that is pretty common is that uh, students are out of practice being together. Yeah. Uh, they're out of practice in being in a classroom and participating in a classroom because for the last year and a half, we've all been seeing each other through a screen and it's really easy to just stay on the mute button mm -hmm. or just blank out your screen and you can sort of passively participate. And we've gotten into practice doing that. And so we're all sort of used to that. And it's gonna take a lot to sort of take the screen away, not just the literal, but sort of the, the, the metaphorical screen and unmute ourselves. and participate again and just practice being together. Mm -hmm. Obviously in a safe way uh, where you feel comfortable and all of that. I mean, we want to be wise and healthy, of course, but yeah, it's going to take practice. Yeah, and maybe that's one of the harder things because we can weird. practice once, <laughs> but if Penn State practiced once for the mm -hmm. Auburn game, we wouldn't have gotten the win last night. You got to continue consistently practicing these things. So yeah, it's a great point. And that's one of the things that is difficult. If you want to practice hospitality, actually that, that it does say practice hospitality. Uh, that, that's more than just a one-off thing. I mean, it's, it's consistent. So what, what other barriers do you see? Yeah, that's, that's a great point. There's lots of anxiety around doing new things. And I, maybe even more so now, <laughs> there's anxiety around trying new things. But I'm going to disagree with you a little bit because I, I, I don't know what it's like to be you. But I've seen you try new things and be all in on it. And as a matter of fact, two weeks ago, you came and played volleyball with me over at East with Jackson, and you were killing it, and it was new, and you were talking to people. So I'm just saying, I've seen you try new things. So but I've I seen you do it before. Myself. What's that? I wasn't by myself. No, you weren't. But you were doing new things. Yeah. All right. Any other any other thoughts around this barriers to us creating this type of a community? I did. Yeah. I mean, uh, kind of, you touched on it with, with COVID, it's made it worse, just kind of isolation, yeah. this kind yeah, of tendency that we've got, we've got to kind of work on. But even yeah. before that, just culturally, right, we've got this very independence, you know, keep to myself, do it myself kind of thing. Whereas, like, the community here, like, people were already in the habit of living in community mm -hmm. in, in Jewish culture and stuff mm. there in the Middle East, you know what I mean, which is kind of gives them a little bit of a leg up on they were at least used to working together, you know what I mean? And, and we've got to overcome kind of our independent <laughs> culture just to like get together and, and yeah. have that kind of interdependency and, you know, there's a little bit of resistance. 
that being said, I think people still need it and they know they need it. And I think even with COVID um, and all the isolationist you know, practices that are kind of put upon us, some of us are like, yeah, I'm just, I like being by myself. That's good. Introverts rejoice, you know. Um, <laughs> but then I think others, too, are, are hungry for that human interaction again. I'm like, finally, a human being interacted with me again right. and invited me to something in right. person, you know. Yeah. Right. So it can kind of work both ways. Yeah, I, I wish we, and, and this probably is never going to happen, but I wish we could go back to the days where there was like a town square. Because yeah. everybody lived in a really teeny home and all, you know, the, the happenings happened in the town square. And as the sizes of our homes have grown, we've had less need for something like that. Yeah. And less reliance on other people. Yeah. Um, but maybe we can, we can figure out a, you know, a metaphorical town square or something. Yeah. And, and Amaya, last, last oh, one yeah, on this yeah. topic. Just going off of what Sil Marie said about the, being being in comfort zone, I think um, it says they sold their property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. And like, that's uncomfortable <laughs> to sell everything and to, to another person so they can come and be invited and to feel loved. And I think that could be a barrier is just our comfortability level. And are we willing to like bridge the gap between people that are different from us or don't have the same things or look at life differently? And are we willing to, you know, become one and be a community like that? So. Yeah. Yep, that's a great point. And there are lots of barriers to becoming like what we see here in, in uh, Acts chapter 2. Now, they had lots of problems too, so I don't want to idolize this church. I mean, just keep reading the book of Acts and, and then read the letters of Paul. I mean, there were lots of issues. But man, what a great aspirational goal to try and implement, try and become more like what we see there. But if we're going to do that, we can't just focus on barriers. We need to identify them so that we can get over the barriers. And so what I want to spend the balance of our time on, and it won't be too long, because actually tonight for dinner we have chicken and waffles. We have fried chicken and uh, rotisserie chicken. It's going to be amazing. Lauren made 40 Belgian waffles homemade. It's going to be awesome. All right, so I'm not going to go too long. But I don't want to just focus on barriers, because if that's what you focus on, that's all you see. And you're going to be less likely to move forward. Rather, what are the opportunities that you see in trying to build this Acts 2 community here and now? What are the opportunities that we need to take advantage of to build a community like that here and now, or even to do so more and more? That's well said. One of the main goals of this faith community so that other people can get to know God too. That's one of the reasons that we exist, absolutely. Yeah, and so maybe to rephrase it just a bit, I, I love how you said it, but just to sort of apply it, maybe it's like uh, taking the opportunity to connect with the other people in the community and sort of experiencing that, that synergy that you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Holy Spirit. Yeah. That's in each other. What other opportunities do you all see? Yeah, that's great. I think there is a, yeah, there's a backlog of just people wanting to connect and wanting to do something and get out of their homes. And hey, by the way, we do a lot of fun stuff. So, it's a great opportunity. Yeah, anything else? Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, basically in every other aspect of life, there's coaching for it. Uh, whether it's sports or life coaching or career coaching or, you know, even executives have coaches and stuff. And, um, uh, I think that's one of the resources that, uh, that we could tap into, for sure. Yeah, and unfortunately, Sunday is still one of the most segregated days of the year, not only by race, but mm -hmm. class and basically any other way that you could segregate yourself. Right. Uh, it, it should not be that way. It shouldn't. Yeah, so I appreciate that. Uh, so as we close out this discussion and we get ready for some chicken and waffles here, uh, I just want to lay before you the idea that there are many, many opportunities that you can take even today, even this week, to grow as an individual, but also to contribute to this faith community growing and becoming more like what we see in the book of Acts. Uh, and that is the hope, that's the prayer, that as we participate, uh, and not just spectate, but we're active members, uh, of our lives and also of this community. Uh, we're going to experience transformation on a regular basis, on a daily basis. Uh, and as we do that, we won't be able to help but say, just, just come and see and we'll experience the multiplication that, that comes from God adding to our number. 
So why don't we close in prayer? Uh, there's no real announcements. Um, just you know, check your email and the, the church calendar. Um, we do have a couple of events coming up, but we'll, we'll all be out there. And uh, give, me, give me five minutes, and we're gonna. Uh, if, if our family group can go over here and, and just do all the last kind of finishing touches on getting dinner ready, and then five minutes after we break, y'all can come over and start eating. Okay, so why don't we close in prayer, and then we're gonna eat some good food. Uh, Father, we're so grateful that we can pray to you and uh, that you even tell us to approach your throne of grace with confidence, knowing that you love us, you care about us, um, and that, that you've got in store blessings for us, great things for us. Uh, I pray that we can practice the things that we've talked about today consistently, that we can be fully engaged in pursuing you and becoming more like your son Jesus and also in uh, growing this faith community in faith in number um, and in transformation. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're dismissed. Again, in five minutes, you're going to be eating some chicken and waffles. We've got rotisserie chicken and fried chicken. Zoom, folks. I wish you could participate, but it doesn't work on Zoom. See ya. <laughs>